But right now, I'm very pleased to say we've, we've been joined by another guest, and hopefully uh, your left shoulder, uh, Dave, might just get a little bit wet, but um, he's, he's right-handed. He says that's not a problem. Dave Miley, tennis director of the Kazakhstan Tennis Federation, That's right. has joined us. Good afternoon to you. Hi, how are you doing? Well, I'm very well now that we've managed to move. And actually, it's looking a bit brighter again over in the distance. So maybe this is only going to be another short interruption. But excited to talk about Kazakhstan tennis, yeah. which, of course, is on fire at the moment. You've got a defending champion here and you've got a man who just won in Halle. Yes. So what, what, what's the magic you've been sprinkling in the earth there? Well, I can't take any credit for Lena Rybakina or, or Alexander Bublik, but they're playing great at the moment. Alexander is, you know, beat three top ten players in Halle and last night had a tough match against Mackenzie McDonald and won. And Lena, of course, last year's champion. So they're, they're really, uh, really great players for the Kazakh players to follow. But we actually have had really good success with younger players. Last year we qualified for the 40 under world team finals and finished fourth, uh, beating Argentina, Italy. And this year we've qualified for the Junior Davis Cup and Billie Jean King Cup juniors under 16, beating Australia 2-0 both times. So really good Kazakh players born and bred in Kazakhstan coming through. So yeah, Lena's been a great example for people and, and we're, we're, I think, trying to work in a very systematic way and having some good success. But what is the reason for these players coming through? I mean, as, as we know in this country, in, in many countries, it's a very difficult science to get absolutely right. Yeah, well, what you've got to see is we, we, have, a very, we have a great president. He really loves tennis and he, he's uh, been very successful as a businessman. So he's been investing since 2007 when he became president. And they, together with the government, they built a lot of tennis centers. There are 38 new tennis centers around the country, indoor courts, because it, it actually gets down to minus 43 sometimes during the winter. Uh, and so that the infrastructure is there now. We have a lot of tournaments. We have actually in Kazakhstan 10 junior ITFs and in Central Asia 48 junior ITFs in four countries. We have challengers, we have entry level futures. So there's a lot of tournaments going on, also national tournaments. And uh, over those years it's gradually built up and I, I moved to Kazakhstan three years ago. Um, I used to work with the ITF, I think you know that, 25 years, short contract. Uh, and, uh, I've Prison been living, sentence. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, that was released for good behaviour. Uh, but I've been living in Kazakhstan and it's, it's a very interesting part of the world. A lot of energy, it's like Astana is very cold in the winter, but it's like a mini Dubai. Uh, Norman Foster buildings everywhere, so it's quite an interesting place to live. But yeah, look, my, my kind of, use, I came from the ITF with knowing quite a bit about what sort of successful federations are, some, some, some have money, some not, some are small, some are big, so there's lots of different systems, and try to put in a system that's in Kazakhstan based on volume of training, number of matches, and of course the big ingredient that you can't really determine is the quality intensity of the training, so I'm trying to get the coaches and the players to work with more quality and more intensity, yeah. so it is kind of working a little bit, I think. I'm glad you've explained your background, because I was going to say I didn't realise the Kazakhstan accent had such an Irish brogue <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. to well, it. Well, I, I, I say to people, don't I look Kazakh now? <laughs> no, but I really, look, Kazakhstan's a great country and uh, it's a very big country. I don't know if people understand is you fly three and a half hours from one side to the other, two time zones. And uh, it's, uh, you know, borders China and uh, Mongolia. And so it really is a, a very much an Asian, Asian country. And I do want to ask you about Alexander Bublik because he's, he's always been, I don't know if it's a great fun to watch, but, you know, he can be... A, so infuriating to watch and then he goes and wins a title as he did in Halle serving three double faults when he was serving for the match and yet still closing it out I mean he is extraordinary Dave. no he's he's incredibly talented and, and I, I you know I've seen Alexander play so many times and and the guy has beaten a lot of top players he's beaten Kasper Ruud in Davis Cup many many good players and he won at 250 a few years ago beating Zarev in the final in uh, in France so it's not, not a surprise. And last year, you've got to remember, he was last 16, up a set in the break against Tiafo in the last 16 here, having won his first three rounds in straight sets. So he, uh, you know, has a, a great chance. Last year when I came here, I, I said, uh, Lena could win the tournament. She's one of 10 players. I said she could win the tournament. I thought because the year before she'd lost to Zabalenka in the last 16. And, and Sasha's a, a little bit like that. He, he had a great run last year. And he's much more focused than he maybe was before or maybe less unfocused, no, but he's, he's much more focused. And he's a great entertainer, he's a great person. And, and the guy has so many weapons. Uh, he does go for a little bit more on the second serve, and that's why he double falls. But the, by doing that, it's really hard to break him. Yeah. And yesterday he was down, you know, he was down 4-1 second, third set, set all, and, and played unbelievable tennis the next two sets. So he's a really dangerous guy in the, in the draw, I think. You touched on his mindset, and, and obviously he, he can go AWOL. Can you just tell us a little bit about what he's like off court and, and 
what you think he is actually thinking when he, he's playing. He's a great guy. Look, I, I give you an example. We, we had a 10 and under Masters tournament where we had the best eight boys and girls playing last December. I asked him would he do a, a question and answer on Zoom, and he does it. He does it. He does that stuff. When we had our team playing in... Um, in Czech Republic in the finals, he did a message to them all, wishing them the best of luck. So he's really got a great heart. And, you know, Alexander, he, he got married a year ago. He's just had a kid and stuff. And I think he's, he's a very different person maybe than he was a couple of years ago. And he, he, when he's focused, he's very, very dangerous. And, uh, but he is a very special player. He's very, very talented, as you can see. He can do so many things. And uh, sometimes in tennis, I think anybody who's played, whatever level you play, sometimes it's maybe better to have only th four or five options, but he has maybe 10 or 15 options that he could use, so that, are, that he's really good. But, uh, you know, I, I, I think he has a great chance, uh, but this is a tough tournament. You never know what's going to happen, but if he, he's not going to be easy to beat. He's got such good weapons, he's hard to break, and he's a great off the ground. I mean, the guy returns serve great. And uh, so we've got two players, I mean, and Lena, I've got to tell you that when Lena won Wimbledon last year, she flew straight back to Kazakhstan, met, people met her at the airport, and she donated 50,000 from her prize money for players, and that was divided up to the best 12 and under, 14 under girls. So, she, you know, she, she's really a, a great girl from that point of view and trying to help Kazakhstan tennis, and, and both of them, because they're high profile in different ways, Alexander has a great following because of the way he plays and leader because of the person she is and success she's had. So yeah, it, it's all of these things come together, but you know, just having good players is not not the answer. There's a lot of countries that sometimes have good players, but you need a system that will the, the good players are the pull effect, but you need the push effect of the system, the number of matches, the training and stuff like that. And that's the combination that can be very very successful. And that's what we're trying to do in Kazakhstan and I, I said earlier we have a president that really loves tennis. I mean, he plays tennis, he gets on the court, and that's why he's helping. He's, he doesn't need to be involved in this for his, his any business reasons. He just wants to see tennis grow and he loves his country, so it's pretty good. Well, Dave, you, you said 25 years at the ITF that uh, good federations and not so good federations. Yeah. So, so what three positives would you say of good federations and what three negatives would you say that federations could do better in general? Without, without obviously mentioning names, because because yeah, it, is, yeah. it is the holy grail. You know what? What ultimately? How do you get players? Is is it the French system, which is the tournaments, and getting and getting that that base? You're absolutely right. Look, there's a lot of different systems. The Czech system is different to the French system. The Grand Slams a lot of money. To me, two of the best systems in the world are Canada and Italy. They really had great success. That, started 10 years ago and they're coming through but there's also a lot of smaller countries like Belgium even Finland now and Norway having good success so it's not about money and for me what your question is because I've actually recorded something about what makes an effective tennis federation before probably only my kids watched it but that's okay um, first is using limited resource effectively so everybody complains, oh, we should have more money, we can't do this, and Claire and I, we know it from <laughs> Ireland, everybody's always complaining, if we had the money, we could do it. No, use the courts, the coaches, and the money you have. And, and second thing is it needs to be driven by tennis. Sometimes the most dangerous thing in, in federations is people who think they know tennis, and they don't. I don't know tennis. I'm learning all the, every day is a school day. So I think I know it okay. So, so you need it to be driven by, by, by tennis kind of expertise and supported by other people like the financial, the, the, all the other people you need. And to me, the last thing is that people focus a little bit too much on the training. For me, the success is the competition. So you see the countries like, like why is Russia so good? Because actually up to the age of 14, their competition structure is incredible. Uh, you know, they've been successful in the past. Czech Republic, very good system. Spain, I mean, the competition system is ruthless. If you get to the top of that, you're really strong. So those three things, the competition, don't drive too much by the training. Competition drives the, the, the coaching and training supports. So you get training, tennis, technical, tactical, physical, mental training, to do better in the competition. Are we going about that in the right way in this country? Claire? Well, in this country, and I can only speak as a, as a parent, um, less as a tennis coach, but a parent who is who's, who's traveling around a lot of these tournaments now with, with my daughters to play. I mean, the, the competition structure here. We've, we've played, <laughs> my daughter and Claire's daughter. Oh, who won? Your daughter. Well, I wasn't there. So, right. and I, and I, Is that I, why she won? 
it was probably, but I tend Have kind of not... Have you been banned I, well, by I don't, Fergus I, Murphy? I don't, I, don't, <laughs> I don't particularly enjoy it as a parent. Mm. I don't enjoy being at these tournaments. And it's interesting because when I was a child, I loved being at tennis tournaments yeah. in Ireland. And they were very, very sociable things and obviously very competitive. But nowadays, this competition structure, for me, I, I call it, it's mm. sterile. I take my very children good. to a tournament and I'm, yeah. I'm, it's I, one day. I, they make no friends. And, and I struggle a, a lot with that. And then, and then also, obviously, dealing with talking to other parents, um, which I try not to do, if I'm honest with you. But um, just because the whole idea of professional tennis starts very young now for, for people, people's tennis journey. The conversations are ridiculous. It's a long journey, but it needs to be more user-friendly. I'm all the time talking. In fact, I'll give you a good example. With the ITF, with their junior ITF grade fives, fours, and threes, for me, they should be placement matches. Everybody should play five matches. Mm. So the last day, they're playing first, second, all the way down to 31st, 32nd. Different points, because then if you send a player for 10 terms, they get 50 matches. At the moment, you don't know if they're going to get 50 or 10. So all the system, and, and boy meets girl, make it more social, playing whatever you mix, just doing things that make it more nicer. Team the competitions. Yeah, and, and team as well, it's, because... But, the, yeah, the, but the, get, that's a great... To get knowing you're going to get a certain number of yeah. matches if you've travelled halfway across of the course. world of course. and you go out in the first round and it's a, that's a terrific be, idea be, no but you have to because I mean most of the tennis Europe and the Asian tennis under 14 and 12 are, are placement matches I don't like to use consolation I hate that word because yeah. consolation is like it's not important it's placement there was once a competition that I played European Championships Lost first round, went into the consolation, then I went into the last hope. No, I hated Dave. that word. <laughs> I, I, I actually broke my racket. The last that hope. tournament. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But I can see oh, why. No why I see why you'd be the last hope. Oh, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, uh, I should just point out. Unfortunately, it is raining quite consistently at the moment. There is a bit of sunshine above us. It, it is quite bright. So fingers crossed, it's going to dry up again sooner rather than later. Dave, what do you think about exposure to the game? Because this was something I definitely struggled with in Ireland, that I didn't have exposure to what the standards of the, the, of the top of the game was. I obviously looked at Wimbledon and I saw the beautiful courts and people playing here, but, but I never knew the levels. But this is very important because the thing about tennis, if you're, if you're, <clears throat> if you're a 100-metre runner and you run at a certain time, wherever you are in the world, you know you're good. The problem with tennis is you have to play against good players to know how good you are. So what, what I've done in Kazakhstan is I've put together a pathway, which is very simple, basically how many hours you have to train as a guide, how much fitness, how much tennis, how many matches, and then what tournaments you should focus on at 12, 14, 16, 18, if you want to make a pathway to the professional, just a guide, because you can come in different ways. But for example, a 14 under player should probably be playing about 50% of their matches outside either Tennis Europe or ATF, and they should be trying to get a ranking, say, in the top 80, 70 in Tennis Europe. So there's sort of a guide, and you go and play those and see how good you are, because sometimes, if you're beaten very easily, it motivates you to work harder. You know, but if you don't know the level, and that's why I'm always saying in but, Ireland they need to play outside of Ireland a bit but, more. But what happens if you can't afford it? Well, this is the thing. That's why I said earlier, use limited resources effectively. So, again, it's the first step you think is, what would you like to do? And then, OK, you look and see how much you have. Maybe the club gives you some, maybe the parents, maybe the federation gives a little bit. It's a team effort. And then you do the best you can with what you've got. But a lot of people, they say, oh, if we only had the money, we'll do. No, just it's what I, I, I when I, I wrote a manual years ago, back in 98, the advanced coaches manual, and I used a word called planification. Planification is all about planning. It includes education, the travel, the fitness, everything together and the budget how much money you have, and you do the best you can. Mm. It is a very expensive sport from the point of view because no other sport have kids traveling 20 weeks of the year at age 13. You know, and tennis is like that. But unfortunately, that's what you have to do if you want to be good. And you, you're kidding yourself if you think you need to play 60 matches a year, probably 50% of them outside of the country, uh, at the age of 12 and 14. And over 14, you have to play 80 matches. But then you have to, sorry, Claire, but then you have the situation with Ben Shelton. That's why I love that story, because he's gone against the grain, hasn't he? He hadn't been out of the States but until he went down to Australia. Yeah, but there's always exceptions, like Venus and Serena are yeah. exceptions, but it's, you know, most of the players playing professional have gone through, at some stage, the junior system, and they've done the, the, the number of matches. I can show you Casper Ruud and Sinner and all those guys, and the girls as well, but there are always exceptions. There's a lot of ways, so you can't say it's a rule, but it's a good guide. 
Yeah, and, yeah. and, and obviously in the States, a much bigger country, and there is a lot of, a lot a lot of tournaments going yeah. there. I mean, one, one thing I'm quite curious about at the moment is when you talk about kids playing tennis at such a young age, and then my fear a little bit is that that the young kids, when they get to about the age of 11 or 12, they're actually burnt out already because they've been playing so much tennis. They've been trying to get on the road to stardom for, for you know, at, at such a young age. And, you know, in particular, I'm, I'm kind of amazed when I look at 10-year-old girls or boys from, from, from here in Britain and how many matches they played that year. And, and it just seems an extraordinary high amount. I agree. I think they need to be playing other sports. They have to be doing other things. And I go back to, you know, one of the things I did with the ITF when I joined in 92, I traveled all the Soviet countries because they all joined the ITF between 92 and 97, starting in Estonia, finishing in Dushanbe in Tajikistan. A lot of the success of the girls was because they all did gymnastics. They all did gymnastics in school. And so they were much more coordinated, much more balanced. And suddenly you saw all these East European players coming in. But it's because it's not just the tennis, it's the, it's the other things. And I think this is why other sports, having to give up too soon is not a good idea. But, but at the moment, my own experience is, is that from having you know, a child maybe who's 11 years of age, who does play a lot of other sports, mm -hmm. She's actually behind in terms of the other players that are really good in in her in her age group already because she hasn't played the amount of hours and she is playing uh, you know other sports and you've got to manage her body so it, it's it's a it's a really tricky one because you're trying to get into the system and trying to be recognised but yet to do that at the moment at, at, at such a young age potentially could be burning yourself yeah, yeah. out and and I think the future of the game is you know because it's all about player development also participation. And so we need to think about how we keep players in the game who realize at 13, 14, they're not going to be top players, but they like to play. And that's where the big yeah. work has to be in the clubs to make it very interesting and nice that you can play. I, I'm but glad you it, brought, sorry, Brian, yeah. because this is the one point I wanted to raise. Well, and this is fascinating stuff, by the way. If you are just joining us on the Wimbledon Radio channel, we are being protected by the new roof that they've spent 30 million pounds on this incredible media facility up on the broadcast roof and thank goodness they've let the roof jut out a bit because it is still raining we've dragged our picnic table under the roof we've got dave miley the tennis director of the kazakhstan tennis federation with claire curran and barry can and the point i wanted to raise to you because for me this is the biggest problem in the united kingdom dave uh, and claire's quite right players start very young they play an awful lot of matches the boys in particular, they get to 13 or 14, they're still very young, and at that stage, a handful are picked to go to the academies, and the rest are thrown out. The, the regional funding they got to go to a few coaching sessions is taken away, and most of them, and they're still talented, and a lot of them have still got an awful lot of potential to tap into, are ignored. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder, what you do about that in well, Kazakhstan? He, he, well, in Kazakhstan, but let me tell you about globally, because you know I was very much involved in the ITF in participation play and stay campaign, is people say things sometimes that tennis should be driven by competition. I actually think it's not true. It should be driven by user-friendly competition. And so user-friendly means those kids who finish at 14, what are the user-friendly competition? Maybe using rating systems, uh, that they feel they're achieving something, that maybe it's U.S. scholarships in the future or something, but you need to make the competition user-friendly, not just for these players, but for the adults as well. People who don't have much time, they want to play, but so let's make it time. Make, the, make it so maybe that... So a lot of the clubs, they say, well, we do a club night on Wednesday. Well, it doesn't suit me. Oh, well, sorry. But let's try to find a way to... to user-friendly competition to keep people in the game. Yeah, keep the base well, as big well, as possible. A, a story, uh, I'm not going to mention the person's name and I'm certainly not going to mention the club, but nine-year-old wanted to play the ladies' doubles at the tournament with her mother. And there's a total of four entries, but she was deemed too young to enter. And I think that is 100% wrong because surely if the mother thinks that child can cope, enter, Look, right? So, and they say, oh, it's too, you know, the, there's the age limit 16. But this comes back to the- Surely that's wrong, isn't yes, it? Yes, of course. And this comes back to customer services that we have to realize people have a lot of choice. And for example, when you go into a gym, they welcome you, they show you around, they give you a free trial. Sometimes tennis clubs are not so welcoming. 
attention. And we, we, we need to be much better with customer service and how are we going to keep the customer? Because if people are not buying tennis, don't blame the customer. You might need to repackage the, the product tennis, make it a little bit different for different markets, for older people who have a lot of time, for business people who don't have much time. And that's the whole idea of tennis needs to wake up. And too much time we're doing what we did before because we think, but uh, when, Claire, when I was playing and when Claire was playing in Ireland, it was very social. You kind of played the tournaments, it was boy meets girl. Mm. Now it's a little bit too, oh, too heavy. Oh, a lot of that when Claire was playing, <laughs> that's for sure. That's why, that's, uh, it, really, it's kind of why I was in tennis at, at a young age. I, you know, I lo at a young mm. age, I loved playing with, you know, the boys at the tournament. And you know, it, was, it, it was just for a little eight-year-old girl, it was, it was great fun. And it, it was, yeah. So it was important, and those tournaments in Ireland were incredibly sociable. And by the way, you're talking about Ireland, we played tournaments in the rain. So in Ireland, it, it only rains twice a week, once for three days and once for four days. <laughs> yeah, you've got to get on with it sometimes, yeah. haven't you? And actually, why you say that, because one of my biggest bugbears, especially in, in Britain, is, well, we can't produce tennis players because of the climate. No, I, that's I remember, I'm sure, Claire, well, you just touched on it, yeah. age 10, it's raining, mm. or you play in the snow. Now, now sometimes I go to these centres, it's 25 degrees outside and they're playing indoors. I had that in Kazakhstan last week. I came to the te National Tennis Centre, everybody was inside because it was a bit windy. I said, guys, you're going to play te tournaments in Europe in the wind, so get out there. Yeah. I think whenever you're playing outdoors at a young age, it actually forces you to move your feet a lot more, and these players can kind of kind of really good footwork. But there's one thing I like. I kind of want to touch on a, on a story, and it, it's we talk about tennis, and I think it's really important that at the age of 13 or 14, the most important thing is if there's a child and they love the game and they want to play, you've got to pursue that because hunger and desire to want to go out there and pursue this sport that's kind of a big thing. But we had a, an experience this year in Britain with our Billie Jean King Cup team, and we, we actually played Kazakhstan yes, I remember. In, in it, and it came down to the doubles. Yes. And on that court, we had Olivia Nichols um, and Alicia Barnett. Now, not household names. I Sorry, I, I would almost call them two randoms in the, in the world of tennis. And of course, they played against Rabakina, and they and played Danilina, Danilina yeah. Yeah. who wouldn't have had a clue about them, um, we really. Won. And, we, and we won that match. Now, I think that was a, an amazing story because those two girls were, were two girls that you know, one of them went to Loughborough University and went there as a student and just had a very good coach and a great program and they kept playing. And the other one went off in the American um, scholarship system. But they ended up you know, taking Britain to the semi-finals of you know, the, the, Fed, the Billie Jean King Cup with the rest of the team. And this is the point that I kind of make really down to Marcus. What you're saying is that the importance of keeping people in the game is just it, it, it breaks my heart whenever we look at you know we think we're going to put that person you know over there and they're going to be sidetracked if they want to play we've got to keep finding ways to get them to stay in the game but you know what i do with the 12 and under 14 under program i break it up into gold silver bronze so gold are players who are really doing well now silver are doing pretty well and and bronze are players who are, who are watching you mm -hmm. and sometimes the watching you become good at 15 16 exactly. and, I'll give, and i'll give you an example we have a kid called bibit zukayev and bibit's 22 right now and at 20 he had no ranking and now he's 265. he won a round in eastbourne qualifying loss last round so again he and watch it he'll be here next year but he's big guy when he was young, maybe he didn't move. So, but now he's two, two, two forty-five, I think, last week. And uh, a year, two years ago, uh, he didn't have yeah. a ranking. Uh, I, I hate talent ID spotting it, because it just isn't that sport. You, it's not. It's not a swimming. It's not athletics. You don't need to talent spot. And it spot. also goes against the what is. It's an anachronism, but it's true. Tennis is a long journey, and you're it all told that. Journey. And yet, all these players are, are cast aside at the age of fourteen. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you've got, to, you've got to give some credit to the results. But what I, I, I use a kind of a rule, which is when the kids are 10 and under, you're probably doing 50-50. When they're 12 and under, it's maybe 60-40 results and talent, and then it goes 70-30. And eventually, even when they're over 14, maybe you're... 75% results, and then you're still watching 25% yeah. to see whether the kids Keep are pretty watching talented. Them, that's yeah. the thing. No, you Keep can... making them feel they're within yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, system yeah, sure. somehow. They're absolutely fascinating to talk to you. Thank you so it's much. We, we, happy we, we kept you for far too long. No, no. But that's Dave Miley, tennis director from the Kazakhstan Tennis Federation. The one thing I'd like you to arrange, because here's Barry moaning about, you know, oh, they should be playing outdoors. Could you get Claire and Barry to play 
in Kazakhstan in the middle of winter outdoors. Yes. Was it minus 35? It's minus 35. We have the river. We're going to put a court special on the river, which is frozen from the end of October, mm -hmm. and we're going to have big media exposure. By the way, we have our ATP tournament coming up in Astana uh, September 24th. Unfortunately, you won't be snowing then, but come during the, maybe the Billie Jean Cup. Last year, Poland came in April, and it was the heaviest snow we had. I, I, I commentated on when it was a 500 event. Oh, yeah, yeah, we had seven of the top ten. But I wasn't invited. I had to commentate in London. Mm. Dave, where was the invitation? I, I, have, a, I have a pull-out bed for you. No problem. Yeah. Thank you. We'll, we'll all club together I for a one-way ticket for you, Bader. Just a sleeping bag, yeah. fine. Yeah, one way, for <laughs> thank sure. Thank you. Listen, Dave, thank you so much. Good luck to Alexander Bublik and to Elena Rabakina, who begins the defence of her title this afternoon.